Well, hello again. In this example, you will learn how to apply the force-based approach to solve for the reactions in a one-degree statically indeterminate beam. We're going to be taking a look at this propped cantilever beam here. But before we try to look at the reactions, what we would like to do is confirm that it is indeed statically indeterminate to the first degree. So we've got a reaction here, RBY, RCY, RCX, and the moment at C. That gives us the total number of unknown forces to be four. We haven't made any cuts, so we have one structural piece. And so the total number of equations of equilibrium, which we have, is three. Thus, we know that we are one degree statically indeterminate. What this means is I need to select one redundant force that I will remove from this particular structure. Eligibility is I could remove that one, or that one, or that one. What I could not remove is this, and that last one I marked is not eligible to be chosen as redundant simply because I can already solve for that using equilibrium. Summation of forces in the x would give me what the answer is. Because I want to keep the beam simple to deal with, I'm going to select RBY as the redundant. And what that'll do is that'll ensure that I am left with a nice cantilever beam to work with. That's something we're quite comfortable with. So this is what we get when we remove the redundant at B. We get this cantilever beam with a uniform load over it, total length of 13 feet. Let's go ahead and sketch what the deflected shape looks like for this. And this is what we're going to term the primary structure. This is the one that has the actual original load on it. And we are going to be interested to know how much it deflects there at point B. And I will label that as delta B. Now why at that location? Because we know in the original structure that the displacement at point B is zero. Okay, In the primary structure, since we removed the redundant, it is not zero. But that's the notion here of the force-based method. We are going to use superposition to solve for the final results. So we also get this redundant structure where, in essence, we apply the redundant force back onto that beam. And I'm going to Go ahead and sketch what the deflected shape looks like. It should be straight right in here, and then it curves somewhere in here. Okay, we will be interested to know what the deflection is here. And I'm going to label this as the deflection at B due to a load at B. And the idea is that we get back to our original structure by simply adding the primary structure and the redundant structure back together. This delta B can actually be rewritten, though, in terms of the redundant force, RBY, multiplied by the flexibility coefficient. Whereas, you may recall, flexibility coefficient is the displacement at B due to a unit load at B. All right, so we are superimposing those. And what this tells us then is we know that in the real structure, when I superimpose the primary structure, so there's the displacement at B, plus the redundant structure, it had better give me what was in the original structure. And in the original structure, the displacement was zero. All right, since we already have an expression for that delta BB, I can go ahead and get that substitute in. So delta B plus RBY times the flexibility coefficient is zero. That can all be reworked and written in terms of my redundant force. So it's negative delta B over FBB. So to be able to solve for the redundant force, I'm going to have to solve for two deflections. And those two deflections are 
that we want the displacement in the primary structure and we also want that displacement not in the redundant structure but in the flexibility structure. The flexibility structure is when I place a unit load on it and it creates a displaced shape and the resulting displacement here is that flexibility coefficient which I'm going to just remind you is the deflection at B due to a unit load at B. So that one should be simple enough. So two deflections need to be computed. Now because these are cantilever beams it's quite convenient because I can use a beam chart to solve for these desired unknowns. So here is for a cantilever beam uniform load on it. Pay attention to where the origin is on this beam chart and then we simply will use this to solve for delta B where the length we will use is 13 feet. The point of interest, so that is this x value, is at a distance of 10 feet and of course the distributed load is 2 kips per foot. So let's go ahead and get that plugged in. Delta B is equal to negative 2 times 10 squared over 24 EI, 6 times 13 squared minus 4 times 13 times 10 plus 10 squared and this is equal to negative 4950 EI. Okay, so that's delta B and to get the deflection here due to a unit load at point B, we will once again use a beam chart. And what we want to do for this, once again recognize that our origin is at the fixed end, so we will use length of 10 feet. Now why 10 feet? Why not 13? Well think about it, in, our, in the structure that we're analyzing, we want to know the deflection right here wherever the point load is being placed. The actual structure may extend another three feet beyond that, but essentially that part of the structure goes along for the ride. So we can just envision this as a cantilever beam with a point load on the tip. So a length of 10, x of 10 feet, and then p needs to be a negative one. Why a negative one? We'll take a look here. On the beam chart, this is the direction that the load is applied. On my flexibility structure, it is being applied in the upward direction, so it's opposite of what the beam chart was showing. We get FBB is equal to a negative, negative 1 times 10 squared over 6 EI, 3 times 10 minus 10 that computes out to be a positive 1000 over 3 EI. That is a positive value. And let me just give you a general piece of information. Whenever your subscripts are the same, your flexibility coefficient should always be a positive value. Regardless of the direction it's moving, it should always be a positive value. All that is stating is that your structure deflects in the direction that the force is being applied. So the next thing we want to do is go ahead and take these two deflections and insert them into the compatibility equation that we developed earlier. So we want to put delta B up here in the numerator and in the denominator we'll put that flexibility coefficient. The EIs of course will cancel out and this will give us 1485 kips. The positive value says that I did assume the correct direction. Here's where I assumed the direction. And so we know that it is an upward force. And we can go ahead and sketch that on here at being 14.85 kips. Of course,
course we still have this RCY and the MC. We will also have a resultant out here for this distributed load of being 26 kips, which is nothing more than 2 kips per foot times 13 feet. And this is going to act out here at 6.5 feet. So we can run the equilibrium equations on this. That concludes this example. And as always, it's a beautiful day to study structures.